Thank you, Claire Short, for agreeing to speak uh, on Not the Andrew Marr Show. Uh, Claire, former civil servant, then MP from 1983 to 2010, NEC member from 1988 to 97. Uh, in 1997, uh, when Labour got to government, uh, Claire became the Secretary of State for International Development, uh, but resigned from the government in 2003 in opposition to the Iraq war um, and continued to speak out uh, on the back benches. In fact, uh, dropped the whip uh, before 2010 and uh, was in some way politically homeless on, on the back benches because not even a member of the Labour Party. Have I got that all right, Claire? Yes, that's right. Um, now, what I what I wanted to talk to you today, what, the reason why I asked uh, if you could come and speak was I had an interview last week with um, Michael Crick, the a seasoned commentator. Uh, I'll just play you a short clip of, of what he said. By purging the left like this, uh, they are purging a strand of strands of opinion that and strands of challenge. And a mm -hmm. confident Labour leader, somebody like Clement Attlee or Harold Wilson or Jim Callaghan uh, or Tony Blair even was 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 happy and Gordon Brown. They were all happy to have. Uh, prominent left wingers in their cabinet, um, and uh, you know, Nye Bevan or uh, Barbara Castle or Tony Benn, or later on, John Prescott and Claire Short, and okay, she had, and Robin Cook. You know, there were a few resignations, but uh, yeah. you know, you had and these were big figures, um, yeah. and and contributed <clears throat> to internal debate uh, and made their points. And the, you know, that that pluralism, I think, was healthy. And if, if you only have in your cabinet and in your government, yes, people, as you say, and people who are uh, don't aren't willing to voice views of their own and live in fear that they'll be purged if they do. It's very unhealthy. And, uh, you know, ideas need to be tested into in, through internal debate and in and as well as public debate, of course. Those Labour prime ministers were confident intellectually enough to have other voices within their cabinet who would argue their case and, and, and come to some kind of agreement. Keir Starmer's Labour seems to have taken out lots of uh, people in candidate selection who are regarded as left. Um, and it looks like a lot of people are saying that Labour's not going to have that pluralism within it um, if it does get into government. How dangerous do you think that is for Labour? Well, I think the narrowing weakens and will make any government that may form, and it's not guaranteed Labour gets an overall majority, um, you know, even now. Remember, in 97, Labour had 50 seats in Scotland, and now there's one. So even if Labour's ahead in the polls, there's a heck of a way to go to get an overall majority. So, of course, if there's no overall majority, some of the radicalism might come with having to make agreements with other parties. But assuming it was just up to the Labour Party, and I mean, you said other confident leaders had people across the range of views in their cabinet. This is people can't even be in Parliament, be in the back benches, who have any radicalism in, radicalism in them at all. I mean, the narrowness means a very sort of frightened party with little creativity. I mean, the Financial Times was running a campaign a bit ago about make the change that's needed. And I used to joke, well, if only the Labour Party would be as radical as the Financial Times, we might make some progress. Um, so, I mean, be, being scared of your own shadow doesn't make for a confident, good quality government. And not having any debate or challenge within the party, within the parliamentary party, uh, within the government, means it will be a very timid government and limited in its capacity. I mean, I'm one of those who, who there has to be some limit on the left, because, you know, we've got a whole history of trustless groups coming into the party and trying to take over chunks of it. And you do have to deal with that. But it doesn't mean, I mean, the Starmer party would not allow and Ari Bevan, Michael Foote, the later Tony Benn, uh, Margaret Beckett was a lefty in her youth, uh, Neil Kinnock was, you know, CND, and on you go. I mean, lots of these 
big figures of Labour history would not be allowed to be even backbench MPs in uh, the Sama Labour Party. Yeah, I mean, the, the lot in the last day we, we saw uh, Zelensky come come over to to, to Westminster and um, and people talking about uh, let's give him some um, aircraft, uh, British aircraft. No voices in Parliament at the moment seem to be speaking out against uh, sending weapons to Ukraine or calling for peace uh, in Ukraine, uh, which it appalls me because, I mean, my, my family, some of my family Quakers believe in pacifism. I, I, I don't see that voice coming across. And if you look at what happened when Keir Starmer threatened the Socialist Campaign Group MPs if they didn't withdraw their names from that Stop the War letter, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty scary if you don't have that pluralism on such a thing as a war, a possible war escalation. What do you think about that? I think the tragedy about when he threatened uh, the campaign group people on this and the, the, stop, the war statement opposed the invasion of Ukraine, but then made some points about how Russia had been provoked. And then they were threatened with not being able to stand as Labour MPs, as this long-standing John MacDonald and, and co. And they all climbed down. I think that was very sad because if they'd stood together, it would have been a real challenge to this narrow, controlling uh, feature of Starmer's Labour. I think personally on Ukraine, the, the serious commentators, the people with expertise in the region, are saying... We need to be looking for how this war comes to an end. Of course, it was wrong for Putin to invade Ukraine. But how long is it going to go on? Is it a NATO war with every drop of Ukrainian blood? Um, it is claimed by some experts that it's not going as well for Ukraine as the propaganda says. So I, I think that's where the serious argument is. But you're right. No one even dares to make that argument. Um, so it's not just about supporting Ukraine or not, it's about how do we bring the war to the end? How do we stop the suffering of the Ukrainian people and indeed the death of lots and lots of young Russians in this miserable, painful war? Um, so I don't know if we could go back to the Minsk agreements. Um, there might have been a resolution if they'd ever been implemented. Anyway, I mean, it seems to me that's where the real discussion ought to be. And even that discussion is not taking place. I mean, you'd have you'd have Tony Benn speaking. I mean, famously about the Iraq uh, when he made that speech that that keeps being put all over social media now. But no, no one in Parliament. That you know, there's a tradition in Parliament, even the First World War, and you know, lots of Labour MPs would, would were against the First World War, and people uh, against the Second World War maybe as well. I mean, what? Why can't people just? have that opinion it, it do you find that strange is that different to, to well it happened? seems to me it, it, i mean it, it's always been that people who are in the shadow cabinet which of course used to be elected that's another thing the elections are being wiped out so the shadow cabinet used to be elected by the parliamentary party now it's appointed by the leader you know more and more top-down power mm -hmm. um but it used to be that if you're in the shadow cabinet, you have to stick with a, a collectively agreed position, though it should, it should be negotiated before it's agreed, which I don't think happens now. But the backbenchers were free to speak up. Now, backbenchers are threatened with not being able to run again as a Labour candidate if they yeah. say anything. So at this time of appalling inequality and poverty in, in the country, you can't hear a Labour voice challenging that. When I stood down in 2010, Ladywood was one of the poorer constituencies in the country. There were no food banks. There's now food banks on every other corner across the country. And that's because of deliberate changes in the benefit system. But, and you'd think there'd be a howl of anger to think of hungry children up and down this land. I don't hear it. I mean, this is shocking. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, 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 the idea that you can't speak out, um, you did speak out. This is this is another part of looking at what you've done in, uh, when you were an MP. You, you, took, you resigned from the whip uh, and you, you spoke out. You said something earlier about the Socialist Campaign Group should have stuck to their guns. I mean, what, why, why, won't, why do you think they weren't 
speak out? Do you have any insight into that? Is it just... I don't. You'd have to ask them. Um, I mean, they did. They signed the thing and they were going to speak at a meeting, weren't they? Or some of them. There were 10 or something. Yeah. And then they withdrew their signatures because they were threatened with not being able to stand as Labour candidates. I mean, you'd have to ask them why they decided not to make a stand. Uh, but obviously, <laughs> the whip is so tough now. I mean, on top of that, for just for local constituency parties, after Starmer made the decision to expel Corbyn, and it seems to me you don't have to be a Corbynista to think, good heavens, that's, uh, you know, not right. I mean, we did, we had a terrible election in 1983. No one talked about expelling Michael Foote. You know, we fought on leaving the EU, um, getting rid, rid of nuclear weapons, you know, longest suicide notes in history and all that. But no one would have dreamed of, of, of making such a proposition. So then that was done. And then, you know, there was an appeal and the NEC reinstated and then Starmer withdrew the whip. Um, and then if local parties wanted to put forward a resolution to discuss asking him to reconsider this decision, you weren't allowed to table a resolution for discussion. I mean, this is this is Stalinism. This is you can't even discuss something. Oh, it's extraordinary. And then, we, of course, we've, you, got, we've, yeah. got, we've got the, the, the escalating cruelty and crisis of the way Israel is behaving towards the Palestinians. And that's a sort of absolute no go. The Labour Party cannot discuss that issue. And it's the sort of apartheid of our era, of this era. Well, you, you, I, you, I know you're not a Labour member, but if you if you said apartheid, uh, you, you'd be out um, for for that. Um, but it, and it, all it, it, all the major international human rights groups, there is, including Israeli human rights groups, have done detailed, thorough studies. It's not just a, a term of abuse, and of course, it's a, it's a crime in international law, apartheid. And they've all said this is an apartheid state. But if, if you're not allowed to say that, if you're in the Labour Party, you can't say what Amnesty International says or what Human Rights Watch says. Or, I yeah. mean, this is incredible. Yeah. I mean, I was going to, to ask you about the, the anti-Semitism smearing because um, I saw an interview that you did while Jeremy was leader on Newsnight and you, you were talking about, um, about how there's a conflation between uh, criticizing Israel and, and um, anti-Semitism. And, uh, and, and that seems to have really um, been the pivotal way of getting rid of people uh, that they don't like on the left, isn't it? I mean, they, it, I've, I've been expelled for, I, mean, I was just suspended for circulating the resignation letter of my chair of my CLP, who mentioned that there was a conflation between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. He wrote that in his letter. I was suspended for circulating this material. Uh, I was asked to do so by the executive of the CLP. Is it, is it kind of, that there's a way that they're finding people that they don't like to push out on any, on any, on any pretense, any reason at all. And this is a tragedy, not only because of no free speech, but the situation Palestine, Israel is escalating more and more, more and more absolute extremist, racist, fascist overturns members coming into the Israeli government and the Labour Party can't discuss it. And there are, there are scholarly works on the deliberate effort to change the definition of anti-Semitism to, to the, what they now call the new anti-Semitism, which is criticism of Israel. Um, so, you know, most of the UN machinery on human rights would be expelled from the Labour Party. An irony of all ironies, large number of Jews have been expelled and suspended for claimed anti-Semitism. I mean, this, this is like a Kafka play. You wouldn't, you couldn't make it up. If anyone had predicted this as a sort of comedy sketch, everyone would say it's silly, couldn't happen, nonsense. Mm. Yeah. I mean, do, do, does this worry you about what a Labour government would be like if, if they're behaving um, with internal party um, matters in this way? Do you think that a Starmer government would be uh, authoritarian and uh, in some way? I mean, I mean, the... 
Anything and, and, foreign would policy, and, and foreign policy as well. I mean, when you're talking about Israel, I mean, what, what would the foreign policy be like? Well, anything could be better than this nasty and incompetent government we've got. But don't hold your breath. If it was Labour with an overall majority, it would be a very, very timid, conservative, small c government. There's little doubt about that. Um, and, and I don't think they'd do that much about inequality and, and the foreign policy presumably would just follow the existing consensus. I mean, they've said they'll reinstate the Department for International Development, then they've said maybe they won't. And, you know, we were a leading player in the international system on development. And development isn't just being kind to the poor. It's a different way of doing foreign policy, trying to build that sustainable world order that we need to deal with climate change and the mounting conflicts that are coming with it and so on. But even that, which doesn't take much courage, isn't a firm commitment. So, no. But, you know, we still would prefer that to what we've got, but it wouldn't be inspiring, I fear. And, you know, and, and just to finally, I, I just want to ask you, because you, you're not in a political party at all, are you? You're not a member. No. Actually, uh, I've, just, I've just joined Unite. You know, Unite has this um, community membership. Yeah, I'm in that. Yeah, I'm a retired member of Unison, but I'm not an activist in that. But I've just joined Unite because I want to become active in my community, Unite, because in these times, and there's an irony, the timid, timid, cautious Labour Party and the trade unions more and more courageous and radical and making a stand against inequality. And indeed, if you look at you know their votes on foreign policy, more and more unions have become committed to justice for the Palestinians and so on. So there's a very interesting development. So I think anyone who can't be in the Labour Party should get into the community unite and we can all get stuck in. Well, that was what I was going to ask. I mean, there's lots of people who are politically homeless, uh, yeah. who, 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 don't, who were keen on Jeremy Corbyn's Labour, have been either purged or just given up. Uh, and you think the unions are, are, are the way, are the way to place to go for them? Well, it's, it's just an irony. The unions are in a more radical position than they've been for a long time, and the Labour Party is in a more timid and cautious position. But all I'm saying is to those who feel homeless, and the homeless are, are a wider group than those who supported Jeremy. There's lots of people who thought Jeremy was a good guy in terms of caring about peace and anti-racism, but not maybe the best leader we'd ever had, but think that the way he's been treated is appalling. But there's a lot of them who are homeless too. All I'm saying is it's a wider group than Corbynistas who are homeless. Well, I mean, my own personal decision is to join Unite and get active in Community Unite, though I, I've only just done it, so I'm not on the ground yet, but I aim to be there. Well, that, um, that, thank you. Thanks so much for uh, agreeing to, to speak. It's interesting to hear what you say about uh, pluralism and, uh, oh, I don't know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare um, what's happening at the moment, but um, it's good, to hear, good, to, good to hear you. I hope, I hope you can uh, come and speak on other things as well later. Yes, I must. I'm going to sign up to your, you, it's on a, you meet on a Sunday? Sunday morning, yeah. Yeah. I will it's, sign like a up. Church, it's like it's like a church. It's like church for uh, socialists. Yes, well, you lapse Quaker. I'm a lapse Catholic. It's a good, you know. We all need somewhere to do our moral bit. <laughs>